Good evening. Tonight there are new developments in several cases, including six arrests from last month's programme. In fact, there's been substantial progress, not least on two of last month's reconstructions. In the case of the murdered helicopter engineer Nimal Samarasina, a woman has been charged in connection with his death. And there's been some progress on that dreadful series of attacks on motorists. We can't give you full details on that tonight, but hopefully we'll have more next month. John Shippey was almost everyone's good friend, it seems. Generous, gregarious, and though no one knew where it had come from, he had plenty of money. He relished popularity. He had lots of friends and lots of girlfriends. But clearly not everyone was so impressed by Mr Shippey. Someone decided to kill him. And maybe in the next ten minutes after this reconstruction, we'll discover who they are and why they did it. Doves is in South Croydon, Surrey. And after working there for almost quarter of a century, John Shippey had risen from a junior in the accounts department to become the finance director. Since his death, the business has discovered that about three quarters of a million pounds has been siphoned from their subsidiary finance company over a period of at least eight years. I'm going to the cricketers. Then I'm going to get some agreements signed. OK, have a nice weekend. You too, darling. Bye. I'd known John for nearly eight years, ever since I joined the company. He was a big man. He had lots of presence. You always knew when he was in a room. If you had a problem and you asked him to solve your problem, he'd always try to do it. His local was the cricketers and um, he had used the pub for many many years for both business and for pleasure John was a very outgoing man that's in the pub in the cricketers. Oh, all right, John. <laughs> now then, what's this about Friday? Everybody all right for it? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. John lived his life in thousands of little compartments, and you didn't really cross over from one to the other unless he really allowed you to. All right, lads, who's up for snacking? He was a completely larger-than-life character. A very kind, generous man. And just good fun to be with. <laughs> I just cannot think of any reason at all why anyone would want to do any harm to John at all. The night of Saturday, the 14th of December, 1991. John and one of his girlfriends, Carol, had dinner with Joe Kavanagh and his wife at a local restaurant. <laughs> You sure you don't want to drink, John? No, no, no. I'm knocking it on the head until after Christmas. Have you told them about the new boat? Mm -mm. No. You got it? Yeah. Mm. What'd you get the white one? Yeah, 40 footer. Are you ready for Spain in May? Is everything all right? Great. Yeah. As usual, Osman, since it's Christmas, why don't you take a photograph? Give me the camera. Here you are. Here you go. The four of them left the restaurant at about one o'clock and John drove Carol to the house he'd helped her buy in Item in Kent. Although he owned a number of homes, he spent much of his time here and would normally stay with Carol at the weekend. But theirs was a volatile relationship, and that night they had a sudden row. John left the house between two and three in the morning in his blue Ford Sierra Sapphire. It wasn't until three days later that Carol realized something might be wrong. Hello? Oh, hello, Joe. How are you? All right, thanks. You haven't seen John at all, have you? He hasn't been down the cricketers for a couple of days now. No, I haven't seen him since Saturday. In fact, I've had Doves on the phone saying he missed an important meeting yesterday. It's not like him at all. I'm beginning to get quite worried. 
20 miles west of Item, the M25 crosses the M23 near the village of Merstham. Later that night, a witness was approaching the village on his way back from a badminton match. I was driving along Rockshaw Road uh, towards Warwick's Wold, and um, I became aware of a car in front who was driving erratically. Uh, a driver and a passenger were looking in both directions and became nervous when I came up behind them. The moment I overtook them and went to look in and see exactly who was in the car, um, they both deliberately turned away, so I really only had a look at the back of their heads. The small network of roads next to the motorway is usually quiet, leading only to a scattering of private houses or to a nearby gypsy camp. Yet at 10 to 11, another witness saw something there that struck him as peculiar. As I passed the junction of Rockshaw Road and continued down towards Warwick's Wold, there were two cars parked on the near side. The car I came to first was a Ford Cortina, and the car in front of that was a blue Ford Sierra with a man leaning into the back of the passenger compartment. And uh, as I passed them, I picked up the headlights in the mirror of the car, which uh, I thought was odd if one of the cars had broken down that both of them had got their headlights on. Just down the road, a couple was watching Newsnight. Oh my God, what was that? I don't know. Sound like I come from the motorway. But you stay here, I'll have a look. No, no, I'll come with you. Having picked my wife up and entered Warwick's world again, there was a blue Sierra which was completely engulfed in flames. And I thought at the time that was the car that I'd just seen previously and passed about 20 minutes earlier. Fine rescue. In Merstham, has a car far, Warwick Wold, Merstham. On our way, sir. There'd been a spate of abandoned cars in this area, and this witness was compiling a video of them. John Shippey's body was found in the boot of his burnt out Sierra. He died from stab wounds. These are identical glasses to the ones he was wearing. They're Cephalo sporting glasses. They're missing, as is this watch, which is uh, a fairly distinctive Seiko watch. So if you've seen these uh, abandoned somewhere, and John Beavis, the cases, we saw him putting identical cases to these into the back of his blue Sierra Sapphire. The cases are missing too. Yes, they are. Um, he kept all his personal and uh, business papers in these uh, cases, and he wouldn't go anywhere without them. The larger one is a Samsonite, hard grey plastic. The other one is a maroon leather case, both with combination locks. I would very much like to know where those cases are. Now, let's just fix dates in people's minds. This is 10 days before Christmas. It was a bitterly cold night that, uh, that Sunday night. Certainly. Sunday morning, there would have been a very heavy frost on the car. Now, there was this three, four days between uh, his last sighting and the discovery of the car. So somewhere, that blue Ford Sierra Sapphire went uh, during that period. It must have been garaged somewhere, left out on the streets. It, it's critical to our investigation. We must know where that car was. It was certainly somewhere for those three days. H613CWS, as you can see, where do you think it probably was? What sort of area? I would say it was in eastern Surrey, North West Kent, maybe South London, Croydon, those sort of areas. Uh, it may have been outside a lockup. Someone may have seen it obstructing their driveway. We really must find out where that car was for those three days. Now there was an implication, as we, as we saw in the reconstruction, that he had an appointment on the Sunday. Yes, despite all the people we've seen, and we've seen um, numerous members of his close associates and business asso acquaintances, um, nobody has mentioned having that appointment with him on that Sunday, and I would very much like to hear from anybody who's made arrangements to meet John on that Sunday, the, the 15th of, D of December. We heard how he sort of compartmentalised his, his life. I mean, do, do you think you've now spoken to everybody who knew him? 
No, he was a very complex character indeed, and in fact the, the way he compartmentalised his life has made my inquiry even more difficult. Um, I w there's possibly parts of his life now uh, that we haven't actually entered into, and uh, if anybody else uh, who's listening to this programme who knew John Shippey, was a girlfriend of John Shippey, had business dealings with John Shippey, who we haven't spoken to, please contact us. Just, uh, it's a bit of a long shot, this, but three canisters like this, camping canisters, canisters of gas, butane gas, were what detonated that explosion in the car. Now, each of them has serial numbers on the bottom, and the three in the back of the car, the serial number's 00491, and if you sold those to somebody, before Sunday the 15th of December. Remember anything about them? 00491, do please give us a call. Mr. Beavis and his colleagues are, are waiting for anybody who's got any information. Here's the number, 081-811-8181. Remember, if you prefer, you can speak to a BBC researcher. Or you can call Rygate Police Station direct. That's on 0737 765 040. That's 0737 765 040. We had a very quick response to some of the appeals we had on last month's programme. The fastest one was to a case on photocall in which someone had used stolen credit cards. He'd been caught on camera buying video equipment. Eighteen viewers gave the same name and a man eventually surrendered himself in Mansfield. He has since been charged with theft and deception. You may recall pictures of a couple on last month's photocall. They were wanted in uh, connection with deceptions chiefly involving stolen personal computers. One Crime Watch viewer thought the couple looked familiar and a man has now been charged with theft and deception. And now to this month's photo call, here to take us through the faces are David Hatcher and Jackie Hames. First, Wiltshire police are keen to trace this man, Edwin Terence Willis. He may have information about a series of deceptions at hotels across the country. He's about six foot and has a number of tattoos, including true love written across his knuckles. If you know where he is now, please ring. Just before midday on the 27th of April, this man walked into the Leeds Permanent Building Society in Yeadon High Street, near Leeds, West Yorkshire. Using what's believed to be a semi-automatic weapon, he demanded money from the cashiers. The same man is also believed to have carried out another robbery not far away at the National Provincial Building Society in Guiseley on the 20th of March. On both occasions, he was wearing a brown cap, beige jacket and trousers, and spoke with a soft, possibly assumed Irish accent. Do you recognise him? Thames Valley police are keen to talk to this couple. It's believed they may have information about a series of checkbook frauds. Around Oxfordshire and North London during 1990, hundreds of stolen checks were cashed. Around the middle of 1991, more transactions started up in the Essex area. The man is Victor Shipton. His wife, Carol, may be using the names Carol Burgoyne or Carol Everett. It's thought they may be in the Rochford area of Essex, making frequent visits to Oxford. In June last year, Victor Shipton hired a red Ford Fiesta, registration number D289CDX. We think he may still be driving it, so if you've seen the car or know where the two of them are now, please ring. If you're in a pub right now, take a look around. You might see Edward Crookshank. He's known to like a drink and the Flying Squad are anxious to talk to him. On March the 16th in East London, this Security Express van was hijacked and robbed. Edward Crookshank is 50 and has a South of England accent. If you've seen him or have information on any of our other photo call cases, please call us now. And here's the number, 0818118181, 0818118181. Our next case could very well have been a murder. In fact, there's no doubt it would have been. Only the victim's knowledge of first aid techniques and extraordinary presence of mind saved her life. So irrational was the attack that police have asked us to protect the identity of everyone involved. The real witnesses appear in our film. We only hear their voices. The witnesses don't appear, we just hear their voices. We don't use the victim's real name, and she only appears in silhouette. Finally, the routine you'll see for collecting takings has been entirely changed since the attempted robbery we're about to see took place. The reconstruction begins on Monday the 23rd of March at Kirkstall in Leeds. The Kirkstall Lights pub is the head office of a chain of four pubs in the West Yorkshire area. Marion had been the company's secretary for the past three years. Right then, let's be off. It's Monday. Dave was to spend the morning visiting the other three pubs and collecting some of the takings. And for the first time, Marion was going with him. 
Another thing is, there's about two orders. Dave thought it more beneficial if I could come along, he could do the monies and I could do the paperwork. By going out, I get an insight into exactly what the directors are doing and what's happening. But I was looking forward to going out on the day. Their last port of call was to be the Traveller's Rest in the Crossgates area of Leeds. And during the morning, various witnesses noticed two men hanging about near the pub. At about midday, the secretary noticed a police car arriving on a routine call. As soon as they saw the police car, then they moved across the road, so obviously that he wouldn't see them, you know, so they looked a bit, a bit suspicious then. Around that time, Dave and Marion were 17 miles away at their first stop in Bradford. While Marion checked through the paperwork, Dave collected up the takings. A few minutes later, they were on their way to the next pub at Hawksworth, another nine miles on. Back at the Traveller's Rest, another witness saw the two men about 100 yards from where they'd been seen 15 minutes earlier. It surprised me why they were stood there because uh, there's no bus stops, there's no taxi rank, there's no shop. So definitely up to no good. Dave and Marion were finished at Hawksworth by about one o'clock. We were at Hawksworth just long enough to collect the monies. We then moved on to the Leeds City Centre Bank where Dave then banked the monies. Half an hour later, having deposited all the cash, they arrived at the Traveller's Rest. Come on, I'm starving. Me too. Are we going to have lunch first? You bet. We'll leave the paperwork till later. Okay. I don't know what I want to eat. About 20 minutes after that, 500 yards away from the Traveller's Rest, another witness was startled by two men sprinting past him and driving off at breakneck speed in a silver Vauxhall Cavalier. they turned off left in the direction of the Traveller's Rest. Thanks. Oh. <clears throat> We're um, just about to shut the food counter. Do you like anything else? Not for me, thanks. No, I'm fine, thanks. The Cavalier was next seen parked opposite Dave's BMW in the pub car park. It's now about three o'clock. We'll go straight home. Look at him there. Although he was laughing, the man appeared to be alone. No, oh, he's got to laugh about. It was ten past three when Dave and Marion were ready to leave. <laughs> Bloody close! I thought at the point, at that point, that um, it was someone, some of the lads, just having a joke with me because that's the way that the company is. We, we are a, sort of a friendly company. Get off! I then found myself looking down the barrel of a gun. Uh, the gun was two foot away from my face. At this point, I realised it wasn't what I suspected in the first place. Give me the money! I gave the man the bag. The bag was out of my hand. And then the man shot me. It was very calculated. And I felt he knew exactly what he, he was doing. Marion was shot in the neck at point-blank range. Call an ambulance! Now! I realised at this point that I had to get down onto the floor on all fours, get rid of the blood out of the airways and come back again just to keep conscious. Yeah, it's Traveller's Rest at Crossgates. We need an ambulance quick. Yeah, I think someone's been shot in the car park. Moments later, the Cavalier was seen speeding down Brian Crescent nearby, closely followed by a silver Ford Orion. The 
attacker um, who shot me, I really would like to ask the man face to face why he would want to shoot me. I have nothing against anyone at all, especially when I gave him the bag. I can't understand why he would want to shoot me. I have two daughters, I have a, a husband, and I have family. He could have robbed a lot of people of one person. Well, John Chambers, Marion was very lucky to survive that shot. Well, it was more than lucky. It was practically a miracle because the bullet went straight through her neck and it missed a jugular vein and a spinal column by fractions of an inch. And she still hasn't fully recovered, has she? No, she still hasn't fully recovered. I anticipate she will recover physically, um, but it'll take a while for her to recover mentally. Mm. Now, we saw at the end of the film the attackers driving off in the Silver Cavalier, followed by a Silver Orion. You're, you're sure that Orion was involved in the incident? Yes, we believe that the Orion was also used by the attackers. It's a Silver Orion. It's a 1.6 gear injection. We're keen to trace that vehicle. The Cavalier was abandoned six-tenths of a mile away in Sandway, near to the junction with the York Road. We believe they transferred to the Orion and would like to hear from anyone who might have seen them. And another positive thing, you do have a very good descriptions of the suspects. Yes, we do. The first man is uh, about 25 years of age. He's five foot eight inches tall with a stocky build. He has short blonde hair. Um, he was wearing a brown stonewashed jacket and blue jeans. The second man, again 25 years of age, with a heavy build. He has dark brown hair and a very distinctive bushy moustache. He's described as wearing a, a, a tan leather bomber jacket and dark trousers. What about the third man, the man who seemed to be laughing to himself, sitting in the Cavalier in the Traveller's Rest car park? Well, we have a, an artist's impression of him. He's described as being in his late twenties. He's got a thin face, a small chin, and his hair is described as mousy, uh, short and neatly cut. Do you know which of the men fired the gun? No, we don't, because they were, the gunman was wearing uh, a ski mask similar to this. Right, and that's... Um... Um, it's, note it's got distinctive red stitching or red piping around the face. It is very hard to understand why the man shot Marion, even though he'd taken the money. What sort of person do you think you're dealing with? Well, he's obviously a very dangerous man indeed. As the, fi as the film has shown, she handed over the bag, she did it exactly as he required, and he quite calmly, quite deliberately, shot her in the face. This man is clearly very violent, he's very, very irrational, he must be caught, uh, because the next victim might not be so lucky. Right, it's very important that you do ring if you, if you can help us at all with that then. Detective Inspector Chambers and his colleagues are waiting here for your call and this is the number here of course, 081 811 8181 or you can call Milgarth Police Station in Leeds Direct and that's 0532 413022 that's 0532, the code for Leeds, 413022 more news from last month's programme. Uh, we showed clothing that had been stolen, including these Wrangler T-shirts made in Egypt. Six tonnes of them had been stolen. And Crime Watch viewers all around the country rang to say they'd seen them. As a direct result, three men have been arrested and charges are now pending. There were also important calls on the murder of Jim Morrison, an off-duty police officer who chased a handbag thief through the streets of London's Covent Garden. The stolen handbag was recovered close to where Mr Robin Morrison was stabbed. The bag contained items from several other robberies and a Crime Watch viewer recognised some of the contents as hers. That's helped to pin down some of the thief's movements. Other calls have helped eliminate a number of suspects, but uh, meanwhile the search for Mr Morrison's killer goes on. There are so far fairly few calls on the uh, John Shippey murder. Still very anxious to find where his blue Ford Sierra Sapphire was between the 15th and the 18th of December. Thought to be in the South London, Croydon, Surrey areas. We've got a name given though for the horse for armed robbery and uh, Edward Terence Willis, uh, the sighting of him and we think of uh, Edward Cruikshank and as you can see quite a lot of calls coming in right now. Let's go now for this month's uh, incident desk. Here are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. First tonight a particularly tragic case. 
25-year-old Barry Bradley was murdered for shouting at a motorist. It happened in Kingsley Road, Hounslow on Friday the 31st of January. Just before midnight, Barry and his fiancée left an Indian restaurant. As they crossed over the road, a speeding car almost hit them. Barry shouted at the driver, who did a U-turn and came back towards them. He opened the window and Barry leant into the car. Moments later, he collapsed in the street. Barry had been stabbed and later that night he died in hospital. The car was a dark-coloured two-door hatchback. The driver was alone and looked Asian. He was about five foot eight tall in his early twenties with black straight hair. He had wispy hair on his jawline and cheeks with a thin moustache and was well-spoken. Buses run regularly down Kingsley Road even at midnight and Hounslow East Tube Station is nearby so we feel sure somebody must have seen something. If you recognise the man or can help in any way, please call. Remember, it was murder and there is a reward. Crawley police need your help to catch a jewel thief. He'd made a poor attempt to disguise himself with boot polish and was chased by police from the shop. On Wednesday the 1st of April, the alarm went off at this jeweller's and police arrived to see a man on the roof. He ran off and in his haste dropped this bag. Do you recognise it or do you know who used it? He's white, in his mid-twenties and about 5 foot 11. And finally, how two quick-thinking counter-assistants stopped an armed robbery at a post office. On Tuesday the 25th of February at 20 past three, a man went into Heath Hayes post office in Cannock. He was armed and seconds after demanding money, he fired a shot at the assistants. Luckily, neither was injured as the bullet hit the glass security screen. He dived to the floor and managed to press the panic button. The man then ran off and got into this stolen Vauxhall Cavalier, which was later found abandoned three quarters of a mile away in Hill Street. We believe this man is the robber. He was seen earlier in the day outside the post office in the Red Cavalier. He's in his late twenties and has thick brown hair with prominent dark eyebrows. It's likely he was also responsible for a series of house burglaries committed earlier that day in the West Midlands area. If you can help on this, or any of our other incident desk cases, please call. Here's the number. And number as ever, 081 811 That's 811 Collecting the calls here, we've had uh, one very prompt call after the shooting of Marion in Kirkstall in Leeds. Uh, the caller has given a name which is being followed up yeah. now. Um, yeah. One call on the Seaco watch has been received, similar to the one that John Shippey wore. Uh, the missing that has gone missing. A report on a briefcase, similar to one of John Shippey's briefcases. We're having a lot of calls on the photocall cases at the moment and some more calls on the John Shippey murder, so uh, we'll keep you posted. Crime Watch doesn't make appeals for missing persons. If someone chooses to make off without telling family or friends, well, you know, it may be reckless, selfish, thoughtless of the worry that they'll have caused, but it's not a crime. Tonight, though, I'm asking one person, please call home. Dinah McNichol, if you're watching, will you call your father, your grandma, or Sarah? All of them are waiting by the phone right now. All they want to hear is that you're alive and well. The fact is that Sergeant Derek Nichol here fears that Dinah has been abducted and may be dead. Dinah's family and friends and one of her teachers have taken part in our reconstruction of the days that led up to her disappearance. None of them has seen her since she went to a rock festival last August. And with the festival season due to start again soon, this appeal is aimed especially at anyone who saw Dinah last year. So how's everything going then? It's going really great actually. I'm getting on really well with Dan, which is great. Before she vanished, Dinah was in good spirits. She'd finished her A-levels and had told her father she'd spend the summer unwinding, maybe travelling. In 1980, her mother was killed in a traffic accident. She was forced to grow up rather quickly. Um, maybe go to India or somewhere. She did admire what her sister had done, and uh, her elder sister, and she wanted to do some sort of thing like uh, do all her studies, get her A-levels, and uh, go to college or university. Dinah had been quiet but self-composed at school and was expected to do well, especially by her history teacher, Paul Luxmore. Her background um, and difficulties in childhood, I think, gave her a greater experience than other, other pupils had. Um, and she was therefore often the person who other pupils turned to for help. 
This is a rock festival at Deptford in southeast London. On the 27th of July, this film was taken by one of Dinah's friends. Next day, Dinah hitched home, and not far from her old school, was spotted by her former teacher. I was driving through East Essex on Sunday afternoon and saw Dinah walking on the side of the road. Um, she was instantly recognisable as Dinah because of her hair and the clothes that she was wearing. So I pulled in and offered her a lift. I knew that she often hitchhikes and she was quite a long way from home. Um, so it seemed to make sense to, to offer her a lift back. During the course of the conversation, I told Dinah that, that the following weekend I'd be going down to Chichester. She asked me if she could have a lift down. She was going to a festival in Liphook in Hampshire, which is nearby. I agreed to do that because otherwise I knew that, that she would be hitchhiking down. <laughs> On her 18th birthday, Dinah became entitled to £2,000. It was compensation for her mother's death. Dinah put it in a building society and then resisted all temptation to draw on it. Why don't you take some money out of your account? No, I don't want to touch that money. I want to save that for university because I'm going to need them. Yeah. We'd spent a week at my nan's, Shona, Dinah and myself, and we'd had a good week doing things like playing crazy golf and going swimming and shopping. I dropped her off at High Barnet Tube Station after lunch on Friday. Oh, thanks for the lift. It's OK. And uh, take care, all right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you, dude. And as I watched her go, I felt very protective and a strong feeling of love for her. And I thought about getting out the car to give her a, a hug goodbye, but I didn't. And that was the last time that I saw her. Next day, as arranged, Paul Luxmore dropped Dinah off near the festival at Liphook in Hampshire, where she'd planned to meet with friends. Oh, thanks for the lift. You're welcome. See ya. Cheers. Take care. I will. Dinah seems to be perfectly happy and relaxed that day. There's nothing unusual about her. Um, she seems to be pleased to have been over with her exams and with her life ahead of her. She certainly wasn't the sort of person who'd be taken in by anybody. She wasn't gullible at all um, and seemed to give me the impression that after going to the festival, she'd be going straight home afterwards. Dinah spent that evening chatting and listening to the music. <coughs> Next day, Sunday the 4th of August, the Torpedo Festival, as it was called, wound down. Yeah, I was thinking, I, I don't think I'm going to come back with you. I might hitch down to Portsmouth. Why Portsmouth? Well, why not really? It's not that far away and I've never been. Um, I'm going to leave my stuff here and I'm going to go off for a while. I'll see you back a bit later. All right, All right. Later. It was about two and a half hours later when Dinah returned from her walk. Look, I'm sorry I've been so long, but as I said before, I'm going to hang around here as long as possible and then I'm going to hitch down to Portsmouth. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks or so. Dinah did introduce us to the man that she was with, but I can't remember his name. She did say that she just met him. He was in his mid-twenties, about five foot nine inches tall, of medium build, casually dressed with wavy dark hair. Next morning, in nearby Greyshot, a villager remembers a couple who were walking down the high street. The woman seemed quite young and short, in fact, Dinah's only four foot ten. The man was maybe ten years older. Dinah's exam results arrived soon after she disappeared. She passed them all. She'd almost certainly get into university. There's no way she would not let us know that uh, she was OK. And uh, we really fear the worst. Derek Nicholl, so do you, don't you? Yes, we do. We are treating this really seriously. The search we done earlier this year at Bramshop Common uh, by, was undertaken by Hampshire Constabulary with over 100 police officers over a three-day period. So as far as you're concerned now, this is effectively a murder hunt? It is 
we can't call it a murder hunt at this stage because obviously we haven't found a body, but we are desperately concerned and we do feel that there is a strong possibility that something has happened to Now, her. one of the, the clues is that that £2,000 that she got as compensation for, for her mother's death, that she, she guarded so carefully, all of that has been withdrawn? With the exception of about hundred odd pounds yes, it was withdrawn at 13 locations around the south coast uh, between the 8th and the 25th of August of last year, uh, as wide a part as Ramsgate, Margate, Haven, Brighton. So that's all pretty ominous? Yes. Um, the chap she was seen with as she left Ramshot Common uh, on the Sunday, the 4th of August, now, I mean, he's by no means likely to be uh, the murderer. I mean, you just need to get hold of him just to find out where she went next. Indeed, we would desperately like to talk to that young man. Um, as you say, he may not be involved at all, but he would be the person that can give us a clue as to where she went if she left that festival site. He's, he's 25 upwards, we think. Five foot nine, we think. We honestly don't know a great deal more about him. The only thing that is distinctive about him is that he was casually dressed at what was extensively a hippie festival, and that is the only thing the young girls that was with her can remember particularly. Just clutching at straws, just assuming that Diana is still alive and just gone off somewhere. Maybe she's joined some sort of sect or something like that. We have looked into that. It is a very difficult area to look at, but from the character and everything I know about her and discovered from her friends, she is not the sort of person they believe anyway to be taken in by one of these sorts of things. She wore contact lenses and actually she was very, very short-sighted, wasn't she? She was indeed. In fact, uh, to coin a phrase, she needed glasses to find her glasses. So if any optician has, uh, has seen her, again, it's a heck of a long shot, but I mean, there were minus 10 or minus 11.5. One, one was minus 10 and one was mi minus 11.5. Any other help that anybody can give? Uh, at the moment, we have no idea where she went or what happened to her after her friends left her at Branshock Common. Okay, well it was uh, Sunday the 4th of August. Very, very hot time last year. If you saw her, please call us. Incidentally, if someone close to you is missing, don't call us. You might like to call the Missing Person Helpline though, set up by the, set up by the Susie Lamplew Trust. There's a the number, 081392 2000, 081392 2000. Coming back to the Diner McNichol, inquiry. The number here in the studio is 081-811-8181. Or if you think you know anything at all, you can try the instant room in Chelmsford. That's on 0245-542-120. 0245-452-120. Well, now just before our second file of photocall faces, some news of a development six days ago. On photocall in March, we showed a man wanted in connection with a murder in South Wales. Though not as a direct result of calls here to the studio, three people have been charged with harbouring and a man has now been charged with murder. And now more faces police hope you might recognise. Here to take us through them are Jackie Hames and David Hatcher. Maybe you know the whereabouts of this man. James Henry Warner comes from Essex and was last seen six months ago in London's West End. He has taken jobs as an insurance agent. During March 1989, a series of fraudulent insurance proposals were made out and a large amount of money was paid in commission to the agent concerned. You may know James Warner better as James Mara or James Kitts. He's probably still got that beard and moustache, although the colour sometimes changes. He's 49 and 5 foot 11, so if you know where he is, please call. Hertfordshire Police would like to speak to this man, seen here opening an account at the Bradford and Bingley Building Society in Hemel Hempstead. Later in the day, a cheque was paid into that account. It was one of two cheques that had been stolen from the Elms Industrial Estate in Bedford. The account holder, who may be calling himself Peter Hall, is in his mid-twenties to early thirties, five foot ten with a heavy build. His brown hair has blonde streaks, so if you recognise him, please call. Maybe you know this man. On the 8th of October last year, he robbed the Cheshire Building Society in Staleybridge, threatening staff with what appeared to be a gun. He's between 30 and 35, about 6 foot 2, with a dark beard and moustache. It's possible he had a Lancashire accent. So, if you recognise him or know where he is now, please ring. Perhaps you know where Kent solicitor Philip John Stokes is now. He was last seen in Dartford at the beginning of April. He may be with Daryl Grimes, a property developer. 
During 1990, all over the southeast, about one and a half million pounds was obtained through fraudulent checks. Accounts were set up using stolen driving licenses. Philip Stokes is 39 and 5 foot 10. He sometimes has a moustache. Daryl Grimes is in his late 20s, 5 foot 8 and has a slim build. So if you know where either man is or can help with any of our photocall cases, please call us now. And there's the number, 081 811 8181, 081 811 8181. There's uh, a lot of calls coming in tonight, a tremendous volume. On the John Shippy inquiry, we think we've got the name of another girlfriend and I think several other people who knew him, acquaintances, have, have called in. Not uh, quite clear yet what sort of evidence they can help with. The Essex couple, we think they've been uh, seen in Oxford by an acquaintance, but that was some time ago. Edward Terence Willis, again several sightings. On the Leeds pub shooting, incidentally, someone's called and we might have a connection with the car, the Orion. Edward Crookshank, we've got sightings there and uh, we've got a couple of possible addresses for him. And uh, just got something in here on the uh, Barry Bradley murder. Someone's put forward uh, a name which the police are quite interested in. Well, we'll have more news for you in Crime Watch Update, I hope. That's at 11.15, just after question time. If you think you just might be able to help on one of the cases you've seen tonight but haven't picked up the phone yet, it is often the smallest details that turn out to be the most important, so please do call. The lines here are going to be open until midnight. We've been on the air for eight years now. This is programme number 80. And something we said at the end of programme one was clearly appreciated by a lot of viewers and it became something of a catchphrase, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. It's clear from letters that we still get, many people still like the reassurance, but Others say they find it irritating. Maybe eight years is enough. So, um, good night. Good night. Date on tonight's Crime Watch UK. Welcome back. It's been a steady flow of calls here tonight rather than a flood, but some good solid information coming in. We've had new leads on two of our reconstructions, on the murder of John Shippey and on the shooting outside the Travellers Rest pub in Leeds. And we've had more than 100 calls offering help on Dinah McNichol, who went missing last August. And indeed, uh, the lines are still very busy. Let's go first to the murder of John Shippey, a successful and a wealthy figure from Surrey, who was stabbed to death and then discovered by Farman in the boot of his blazing car. After Mr. Shippey's death, it emerged that much of his wealth had come from swindling his employers. But uh, that doesn't appear to be the motive for his murder. You've had an extraordinary number of calls on this one. Yes, I, I've been very pleased with the response, and calls are still coming in, I'm pleased to say. Now, this watch, which is uh, a Seiko LaSalle, yes. that seems to have aroused an awful lot of interest. Yes, a lot I'm of calls on that. I'm pleased to say, and one caller in particular would like to see that watch again. This watch was missing, also some briefcases that he used to go around with. Yes, we're getting lots of calls on briefcases that have been found in and around the, uh, the home counties and we will be pursuing those uh, reports. He had a lot of girlfriends and you've discovered two new ones tonight. Yes, we've had two ex-girlfriends contact us and we will be contact contacting them tomorrow. And several people who say that they've been involved with deals with him and several suggesting he was involved in some quite shady deals at times. There are. Um, in fact, I'm surprised I haven't had more calls in relation to some business deals and his business dealings, and I would like to hear from anybody in relation to his business deals. 
His vehicle, a blue Ford Sierra Sapphire, you were very, very anxious to place between the 13th of December, which is when he disappeared, and the 18th of December, which is when he was found. There's his registration number. What have you heard from that? Yes, unfortunately the response to that appeal has been uh, not quite so good. However, we do have one reported sighting in the Thornton Heath area uh, about the relevant time, and we will be pursuing that. Okay, Mr Beavis, let's hope some more comes in with these calls. Thank you. Sue. Well, Jackie Hames has been monitoring calls on our first fort file of photocall cases. First of all, there was the couple that Thames Valley Police want to talk to in connection with a series of checkbook frauds. Mm. This happened around the Oxfordshire North London area. We've had lots of sightings in Essex, which is where we were hoping for. Uh, one call fits in with information already known to police, so that's going to be followed up now, so fingers mm. crossed. Anybody recognise that armed building society, Robin, near Leeds? Well, we've had lots of names suggested, but none of them the same. Um, we do need to know who he is and where he is now so if he rings a bell to you give us a call any calls on Edward Crookshank um, lots of sightings in pubs as probably we expected but if you know where he is please give us a call we do need to speak to him quite urgently and finally the man with true love tattooed on his knuckles Edward um, Edwin Willis wanted by Wiltshire police hmm. they'd like to speak to him about a series of deceptions over 20 calls giving sightings in Wiltshire and some from um, victims of similar crimes so maybe that will help um, investigating this incident so far so good Jackie thanks we're still taking calls on uh, our next case, a search for a teenager who's been missing since last August. Uh, frankly, it's now feared she was abducted and maybe dead. Dinah had been to a rock festival and said she was heading off for the man she'd met that day. I'm going to hang around here as long as possible and then I'm going to hitch down to Portsmouth. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks or so. This looked like a very, very difficult case to follow up, but you've had a remarkable number of calls again. We've had a tremendous response from the public. There's been over 100 calls here, I would think, by now, and, and an equal number at, at the incident office at Chelmsford. Now, frankly, it's very hard to know if any of them are going to lead anywhere from, from those I've seen, people who thought they saw Dinah, but it's very difficult to know if it was her. It, it is very difficult. Many, all of those that we can will be followed up, obviously. Uh, some, obviously, there have been very little we can do to follow them up. She is, or was, perhaps we should say, very distinctive, and she's only four foot ten. She is indeed, yes. But you still are not convinced that anybody has seen her after she was placed at the Rock Festival in early August? I, I am not convinced. Um, obviously, I would very much like to, to have a positive sighting of her, but at, the, at this stage, we haven't got a positive sighting. Derek, I did see that you've made contact with some of her friends and acquaintances there. We have indeed. Two of her friends have, in fact, contacted us in confidence. Uh, obviously, I, I'm not prepared at this stage to discuss what they've disclosed to us, but they are avenues at which we will follow up. I can see over my shoulder another one's uh, just come in on this, which uh, no doubt you'll catch up with them just a moment. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, meanwhile, David, what has uh, been coming in on incident desk? First of all, the murder of uh, Barry Bradley in Hounslow after he shouted at a motorist. Yes, absolutely tragic killing. We've had uh, 15 calls offering names for that artist impression that we showed of the driver of the, uh, the murder vehicle. Um, and we, we'd still like to hear from anybody who can give us names for that artist impression that we showed. None of those names that we've got so far duplicate, so it could be any one of them or none of them. If you think you know who he is, please still call us. Um, then there was the man with the boot polish on his face who robbed a jewellery shop in Crawley in Surrey. Yes, we've had five names for that artist's impression. Uh, in fact, one of the officers who called us thinks he knows who the, the offender is and is fairly optimistic on that one. We haven't had much help, though, on this bag that was left by one of the robbers. Particularly distinctive look because it's got these reflectors on the catches, on the, uh, the lid there. Could be a bag that youngsters wear on bicycles and so on. If you know what that, where that bag came from or anybody who had one like it, please still call us. And then at Cannock, finally, you were hoping to find the man who attempted to rob a post office at gunpoint. In fact, he fired the gun, but uh, luckily because of the security screen, the staff weren't hurt. Yes, that's right. We've got three names suggested who he might be. But again, if you think you know who he is, call us. We're keeping our minds open, but uh, hopefully somebody's already given us the right answer. Let's hope so. David, thank you. We had two files of uh, photo court cases this month. I have to say, this time last month, the police were already on their way out to try and uh, arrest somebody, but... Uh, Actually, not a very high volume of calls, curious enough, on the second batch. No, we're so used to getting such a good response on protocol, but perhaps there's something in here. What about the first one, James Henry Warner, who was uh, wanted in connection with the, an insurance fraud? He used to go under several different names, I think, uh, Mara and Kitts, hmm. among them. 
Um, we've had uh, quite a few yeah. sightings in the Norfolk and South East, um, and we now think he's trying to get a job at the moment within the insurance business. So if he's applied for a job from you, please give us a call. A man trying to pass a stolen uh, cheque in Hamel Hempstead. Actually, that, that I saw some quite good calls on. Yeah, although not many, but very good quality calls rather than quantity. And one name in particular has interested the officers, and we do hope to have good news on this one next week. A tall week. man, six foot two or so, who uh, robbed a building society in Staleybridge. What on that one? Yeah, this was in October last Last year, as you say, a very distinctive man, but only a handful of names, and we are hoping perhaps for something a bit more positive on this. Please, if you know him, ring and us now. The last case, again, nothing very much on Daryl Grange or Philip John Stokes. No, we would like to speak to them, and they may be able to help us with a half million pound fraud um, and only a couple of sightings. Please, good photographs. Give us a ring if you know where they are. Jackie, thank you. Well, now to that shooting in Leeds, which could well have been a murder. Two men were seen around the Crossgates area earlier that, earlier that day, and minutes before the shooting, they were spotted getting into and uh, driving away a stolen Cavalier. And John Chambers, you've had a lot of calls, and one particularly important one on that Cavalier. Yes, we've had one very interesting one from a witness who saw the Cavalier parked in a street called Old Farm Walk, West Park, Leeds 16. Now, that vehicle was seen parked two days prior to the shooting, and it disappeared the morning of the shooting. Now, if this witness saw the vehicle, there's a very good chance that other witnesses did too, and I'd like them to contact us immediately. So that's an important new area for you to focus on now? Definitely, yes. Um, <coughs> the other distinctive thing about this case was the very unusual gun and ammunition that was used. Yes, well, one thing we know for sure is that the uh, pistol used was a 38 calibre semi-automatic. Now, we found a spent cartridge at the scene which had been ejected from the gun. Uh, it's a very unusual cartridge. It's manufactured between 1930 and 1967, and uh, it's specifically designed for uh, a 38 Super semi-automatic, and that's a very unusual gun indeed. So somebody might well recognise that. Definitely, that, yes. That could be a real key. John Chambers, good luck with the rest of your call. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Well, that's just about it for this month. Uh, if you've not managed to get through to us yet this evening, do keep trying. There's some lines free at the moment. Uh, there's half an hour left before the lines here close down. The numbers for the individual investigating forces will be on your screens in just a moment. Till next month, good night. Good night.